mostly in Malda government hospital. So he was uh, doing a research in, uh, on congenital diseases okay, and he acquired a huge amount of data from different hospitals. And it was easy for him to collect data because he is in that field only. Okay. So he got my phone number from one of my colleagues and he rang me and said that I have a huge uh, pool of data and I want your help to analyze that. So I said, okay, fine, I uh, can help you. So he was asking that when can I come down. I said, uh, it's not required immediately for you to come down. I am uh, placing before you three to four questions. Uh, you answer those questions and send me a brief of your data, a very sample data that you have collected. So that I can see the data and I can identify what type of data it is. So <clears throat> I asked him very basic question. Uh, number one uh, was uh, what uh, is your research problem? Uh, what is your subsequent research question? Uh, what are the objectives based on which the data have been collected? And what type of data it is? Is it a parametric data or a non-parametric data? Is it is it a metric data or a non-metric data? What type of data? So, I uh, just raised four questions and uh, emailed him. So, till date I am waiting for the reply. Because now I can understand that he conducted the research or he collected the data without having any idea why he was collecting those data. Okay, so when you are doing research, be very careful what type of data you are handling. Okay, because there is a huge difference between a subjective data and an objective data, a parametric data and a metric data and a non-metric data. So, it, it is very easy to analyze the parametric data. Okay, the data that you are collecting with the help of certain parameters, because that can be quantitatively analyzed. Okay, you can feed a number of statistical process with the help of which you can analyze the data. But when it is a pure qualitative data, pure subjective narration, like a piece of text, uh, a piece of, you know, you, you are taking certain literary work of, say, Rabindranath Thakur, you are trying to analyze a number of verses of Rabindranath Thakur, how they are associated with each other, or you are analyzing Shakespeare, or you are analyzing a part of history or culture where simply textual data is fed. There, the challenge is totally different because in case of subjective data, interpretation becomes very specific to the researcher. That I was discussing in my last class, that the same subjective data, if it is given to you and to him, there may be different interpretation. But if I give same quantitative data, and if I ask you add 2 plus 2 to you, to you, to you it will be the same answer will be coming out. But yes. But in case of qualitative data, it is interpretation of the research, number one. And number two, the interpretation will be directly linked with what to what research problem you have identified, what question you have set for yourself, and what objectives you have prepared so that you are going for the research. So whatever data analysis follows, your interpretation will be based on this is my objective and these are the interpretations. So, if another person is availing or accessing the same data, but his objective is somewhat different, there, there the interpretation may be different. Okay, so this is one. And number two, whenever you are using certain tools and techniques with regard to analysis, if it is computer assisted tool, if it is, you know, manual uh, tool or manual process of assessing the data, be very sure that the data are interconnected with each other. Interconnection means, uh, suppose, uh, you, you, you are uh, you are availing a number of inputs, say a huge number of inputs, uh, data you have taken, uh, say some observations, some surveys, okay, so certain interviews, etc., etc. You have collected a number of data inputs, so there has to be some sort of a uh, network of connectivity between the data. And if you find, in, in uh, quantitative research, we call it redundant data, and redundant data, basically, we delete it. Okay, in, in uh, quantitative analysis, there is a terminology called outliers. Okay, uh, in case of outliers, normally we delete it, because outliers will continuously disturb your data. 
the data frame that you will be preparing outliers will be a disturbing element and if the presence of outliers is prominent or dominant then what will happen at the end of the day when you are getting your results the results will be ambiguous okay it will not be free from errors but as a researcher you want to find out results as far as possible those should be free from errors you see in quantitative data there are a number of ways with the help of which outliers can be deleted there is auto truncation process there is a box truncation process all these are assisted by software but there are processes but in case of subjective data which data is redundant or which data is not a part of your research to find out that particular segment or part is basically the human of the researcher he or she needs to identify that this is not a part of my data set so i will not bring it to the uh, frame of analysis okay fine so from standing on that particular ground when you are taking help of a machine the machine will allow you to analyze the data but the interpretation has to be made by you what the machine will do the machine will allow you to crunch the document okay will will allow you to make a summarization of the document will allow you to uh, go for data visualization subjective data visualization but again what is coming out of that synthesis has to be interpreted by the researcher and then then it should be tallied to your objective like in case of doctor's report whenever the doctor is uh, setting certain uh, recommending certain tests for the patient the patient is visiting the pathological lab and diagnostic centers and they are conducting different type of test you will find that at the bottom it is written it should be clinically correlated that means this is the test result now it should be correlated with your condition actually whether the tests are having any correlation with the physical condition or the disease that you are you know being reported with similarly in case of software is also output of software you will get the result but it should be correlated with the objective that you have set whether they are in sync with each other so that basically will be uh, the responsibility of the research okay so <clears throat> uh, in the last piece in the last class we had a, a look into one of the software uh, softwares which is very popular these days uh, which is called atlas ti and there are other versions of the softwares also as i have said to probably you have heard about envivo envivo is a very popular software with the help of which qualitative data analysis takes place uh, max qda that's another software and i gave you one free software called aquart aquart is a very robust software that almost performs the same job okay so uh, what we actually do in qualitative data analysis is something called a content analysis which is very popular if you search internet you will get a number of inputs regarding uh, what content analysis is how content should be analyzed how analysis uh, should be interpreted and how interpretation should be linked with your uh, research objective so uh, one is content analysis Uh, there are several ways a lot of uh, researchers and academicians have given a number of measurement scales with the help of which uh, content analysis can take place and number 2 is the concept mapping okay after the analyzing of the content uh, there has to be a network or map between all the analytical outputs okay because you are dealing with uh, different types of data suppose for a person who we is sitting uh, at the last uh, she is dealing with fine arts and when we are studying fine arts a number of uh, you, you can say graphical inputs can be there in the form of data say a person from kolabhavan uh, when he or she is studying say certain paintings or certain sculptures and when they are uh, accessed as an input uh, it will not be a text input those will be graphical inputs is a daily input of plates pictures okay and uh, a person who is studying films okay in fdi i was somewhere else say national school of drama when they are going for performing arts so even here in shongit bhavan when they are involved in performing arts so there can be a number of video inputs and audio inputs and that has to be uh, analyzed also 
So that, that is basically the challenge of qualitative data that the type of inputs is uh, you know assorted in nature. There can be text, there can be audio, there can be videos, there can be still graphics. Okay? So that is basically the challenge to, to integrate all these inputs and to uh, come out with a single interpretation. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, before coming uh, uh, to the practice session of Atlas TI once more, because I left out certain things uh, the last day, uh, particularly the query tools I did not take up. Uh, let us have a very quick look into this content analysis. Okay, because this content analysis, the theoretical background has to be absolutely uh, clear uh, before you move to using you know softwares. So I will just go for uh, one or two slides uh, that will help you understand not the entire slide. Okay, in the last class we were talking about this coding. Okay, because subjective data requires coding. See, one of my scholars asked me a question that when I am accessing demographical data, say male and female, and I am coding male as one, female as zero. So there is a binary coding using only two numerals. And then he was asking, did I change a subjective data into an objective data by this process? Okay, because male and female are qualitative inputs subjective inputs but the moment you are coding it with the help of certain binary codification like 1 and 0 because the machine will only understand the numerical codes yes the machine has the capability to understand the string codes also okay but for the time being say we are only giving a binary codification 1 and 0 so male is coded with 1 female is coded with 0 now he is placing a question before me sir did I converted did I convert a qualitative data into a quantitative data I said no. The data it remains a qualitative data. For your ease of interpretation, you have only numerically coded it. Okay, it's not a quantitative data at all. Suppose, for example, age of say a batch of 60 students and uh, age of 60, that's a pure numerical data. Okay, because you need not codify it. Some somebody's age is 20, someone is 21, 23. 19 etc etc so there there will be an average age so that that is a pure quantitative data okay yeah if, if you are sorting uh, in ascending order or descending order basically it becomes an ordinal scale because it, it is a ranking scale okay but when you are codifying a pure qualitative data with the help of certain numerical codes uh, that uh, doesn't mean that you are converting a qualitative data into a quantitative data yes that is for ease of interpretation of the researcher and operational uh, process of the machine. Okay, so we are seeing code, but we didn't yesterday in the last class we went through uh, the types of codes. Okay, those are very important because as you progress in the research, the you know classification of codes become uh, very important. So you see. Uh, in the last class, we were discussing about open coding and how open coding was done in Atlas TI. Okay, so open co coding are basically the preliminary stage coding. Initially, when you are coding it, okay, you are uh, reading a particular transcript, you are reading a particular text, you are going through a particular audio file or a video file or an image file, and then you are putting a code. Okay, so that code basically is what is an identifier. Of that particular part okay the original metadata or the original part of the text or the video the audio the image that is basically the quotation so you are selecting a part of the quotation and putting a code okay the code may be alphanumerical in nature or code may be pure alphabetical in nature or a sentence or a phrase or a single word so that's the initial phase coding okay <clears throat> So why uh, that initial coding is it, it, it searches for key ideas or the issues or the components, events and incidents in the data. Okay, and they are assigned with some degree of flexibility. It depends on the researcher. Okay, but the second phase of the coding is most important, right, which is called the axial coding. In, in case of axial coding, you, you tend to develop the themes. But I was discussing in the last uh, session that every qualitative researcher is trying to develop a schedule for himself or herself in, in his or her mind 
the exact nature or the exact picture he is tries to develop as he or she proceeds through the research work. Okay, so there has to be a thematic build-up. I am fixing up the codes. What is my next objective? Is to club those codes. Okay, creating some super codes or creating a network of codes. Okay, so basically my objective is to build up the theme. Examine the initial codes. The initial codes are done in this particular stage and establish the connection. That is the basic thing. Okay, you are trying to create a network of codes. Because when you will be dealing with multiple set of inputs, you will find that there will be a point of time when uh, you will be coding from the list of codes. So when you are coding from the list of codes, what you are actually doing, you are assigning the same code to multiple quotations. Isn't it? And when you will be doing, doing the network analysis, that particular code which is associated with multiple quotations will be networked. So you are basically building up a theme or a network involving all your data inputs. Okay. And then uh, you go for the selective coding. Uh, that basically is the conceptual and generalization stage at the end. In case of quantitative data what we do, normally we go for the analysis based on certain samples. Isn't it? We are not... Uh, are concerned with the entire universe or the population because it becomes a huge set of data. So we select sample uh, based on certain sampling plan. But what is our objective? Whatever analysis is done on the basis of the sample and whatever results are coming out of the sample analysis, the sample size should be such so that it can be generalized over the population. Okay, so if there are 60 students in the class, say I am taking 50% as a sample, so 30 students were randomly selected for a particular test. So when I am conducting that particular test and I am getting certain results, those results should be applicable to all the 60 students in the class. That's basically the robustness of this uh, test or the analysis that you are creating so that you are in a position to generalize. Subjective data analysis basically is very difficult to, to generalize because when it is subjective data it doesn't give you a very you know specific outcome it, it gives you again a very subjective version of the outcome but somehow on the basis of similarity of the codes on the basis of the network of the codes you will be able to go for some type of concept building or generalization okay <clears throat> So analytical categories are drawn from the codes. So here basically what we do is called the classification. Okay, again uh, if I uh, make a comparative analysis between quantitative and qualitative method, in quantitative method analysis uh, classification is very easy. Okay, because you have a number of uh, ways with the help of which you can go for classification. You have multinomial uh, regression analysis which will classify, you have cluster analysis which will classify, you have discriminant, multiple discriminant analysis which will classify. They will classify the codes. That means uh, there will be code clusters. Say in cluster A there are these codes, in cluster B there, there are these codes. So those are similar codes. So on the basis of the similarity of the codes, you can go for interpretation about your overall result. Oh, okay. So, uh, three types of coding, initial coding made by the researcher for uh, basically it is done for you know searching of ideas, issues, components, events and incidents in the data whereby the researcher is very flexible in uh, doing the code. Then going for uh, the axial coding, axial coding is basically grouping of the codes on the basis of similarity of the codes whereby you tend to develop a theme and the last one is the selective coding when you are developing the code clusters for generalization. Okay, <clears throat> fine, let us skip this code part. Fine, uh, we, we were just uh, um, referring to this, this, this content analysis. Uh, content analysis may mean the interpretation of what is contained in the content. Okay, so if it, if it is a, uh, say, FGI transcript or if it is a piece of literature from Shakespeare or if, uh, if it is a historical piece of literature or if it is a uh, panel data um, regarding uh, say India's economic condition, macroeconomic indices or microeconomic indices okay? or if, if, it, if it is any kind of uh, you know cases 
or if it is any kind of survey data. So basically what we are doing with the help of content analysis, we analyze the entire content in the context to which it is studied. Okay. Content analysis also refers to a procedure for the systematic replicable analysis of the text. This, this, this is very important, replicable analysis of the text so that, you know, once you do the research uh, with the help of a data for analyzing the content, that particular data set must have the flexibility for reused in other contexts also. So, so that Suppose you are studying a particular FGI data or a case analysis or a piece of literary input or a piece of you know, you know, economic data you, you are studying in a particular context, it must have flexibility so that it can be studied in other contexts also. Okay, so replicability issue of particular subjective data is very critical. So it is a method of analyzing written verbal or visual communication. That's I was referring to that when you are going for uh, qualitative data analysis, the input can be uh, of assorted type. Like in case of quantitative data, input is only of a single type, isn't it? All parametric data, all numerals, isn't it? Only one type of data is feeding in. You are conducting uh, bivariates, multivariates, multidimensional scaling, whatever uh, quantitative analysis, but the data input is same, all numerical figures, all statistical figures. Isn't it? But in case of qualitative data, the type of data can be different. It can be dot doc like the text data or PDF data, PDF files. It can be dot jpg or dot png, still graphics image, dot avi, dot mp4, audiography or videography. So the nature of data or the type of data in case of please, uh, it, it is of assorted type. Okay. <clears throat> So, five major types of texts that are used for content analysis. One is the written text. The written text basically is the textual, raw textual part that we use. Uh, oral text, basically the audio uh, files that we access. The iconic text, basically the logos or symbol that we use, uh, includes the graphs, the paintings, posters, drawings, so all those graphical, still graphical images. Audio visual text, it includes the films and videos and hypertext it includes text on the internet. So here is another input, uh, .html file. Okay, so if you are accessing anything from the internet. So probably you see the entire length and breadth of social science is covered. The type of data that you are accessing. Uh, I can put another type of data over here which is the quantitative data. If I add a quantitative data tag, then the all, all different types of data are covered. So, in case of social science also sometimes quantitative data is required. Okay. So, written, oral, this graphical, audiovisual, hypertext. These are the five major kinds of text that are used for content analysis. Why numerical data is not put up here? Because numerical data is not used for any content analysis. Because with the help of numerical data, you are going for inferential, uh, you know, statistics or inferential uh, treatment. Now, there, there are two terms. One is called the manifested content. One is called the latent content. You see, um, how, how to distinguish between these two? Can you give me an example? Sir. सिंपल in a, in a slightly different manner, say, uh, because this is much more from uh, our practical life. Say, as a teacher, when I enter in a class, say, suppose I find after a few days, after a few sessions, I find that out of 30 students, one particular student is very quiet and he's very introvert in nature. He doesn't mix with people very easily. 
uh, he doesn't participate in group activities okay he he doesn't you know advocate himself for any type of presentation or leadership okay uh, even during the you know break hours he doesn't mix with friends he doesn't have a lot of friends uh, he stays quiet he stays alone okay so these are observations okay so these are manifested variables the things that i am observing but you know these are highly subjective data now what is the interpretation that i am making that my interpretation is the boy is very depressed depressed is the latent construct okay depressed or depression cannot be measured directly it should be measured with the help of certain variables like the manifested variable so one in, in case of you see i do not know how many of you have used uh, factor analysis okay in quantitative method there is a technique uh, called factor analysis with the help of which we want to see the underlying factor structure okay suppose there are 50 to 60 number of variables we do not know whether those variables are intercorrelated with each other like in case of principal component analysis or pca we do not know whether these 50 variables are having some kind of relationship with each other so when we run a factor analysis two things takes place one is the intercorrelated variables are clubbed together so after the first phase of the factor analysis which is called the pca principal component analysis all those variables 60 variables will be converted into a linear combination of uncorrelated uh, principal components okay so what will happen all those intercorrelated variables will be clubbed up if it is clubbed up then 50 number of variables may be reduced to 30 so it, it becomes a manageable set of variables this is number one the first step and the second step of the uh, factor analysis is it will allow me to identify the underlying factor structure that means how many variables are clubbed into one factor how many variables are clubbed into second factor say for example say out of 30 factors uh, out of 30 variables say i have identified five factors so in each factor perhaps there are six number of variables so those factors basically are the latent constructs initially when started my research i had only the variables that 216 number i did not know what what, what are the association ship between those variables i ran a test as a result of which it allowed me to interpret and find out that okay these variables are arranged in this way okay so similarly in case of subjective data also when you are going for identifying a latent construct or a latent content that should be latent content basically is the interpretation of the scholar of the researcher because the scholar of the researcher will study the manifested content the content that has been manifest content that has been observed observable content on the basis of that can you attribute those contents to a single construct that becomes your latent construct okay that's through the use of theory yeah yes 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 and this will not be done by machine this this, this is scholars or researchers own acumen own interpretation own skills okay so these are the major approaches of content analysis there there are three one is called the conventional approach direct and summative approach uh steps in conceptual analysis uh you decide the level of analysis decide how many concepts to quote for decide whether to quote for existence or frequency of a concept uh decide on how will you distinguish among the concept that means classification of the concept analyze your result quote the text uh, sorry uh develop rules for your coding of the text decide what to do with the irrelevant information that i have told you out clears basically in case of quantitative data and redundant qualitative uh, text or qualitative uh, content that you need to uh, delete or then that you need to remove from your data analysis set so it it is called uh, ir irrelevant information so you need to remove it otherwise what will happen it, it, it will influence your analysis sir marjesh ji into irrelevant information type pertinent hoye tha mane tale seta irrelevant thakche na 
মানে ধরুন গ্রামে গিয়ে হিউম্যান ট্রাফিকিং এর উপর যখন মানে কোয়ালিটেটিভ রিসার্চ করছে আমি থিম জেনারেট যেটা করছি যে প্রচার নেই বলে পাচার আছে একটা লোক হঠাৎ বলল প্রচার আছে বলে পাচার আছে সো দ্যাট বিকাম সিগনিফিকেন্ট যে কেন না দ্যাট দ্যাট अगेन बिकम्स द इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ द स्कॉलर सी প্রচার আছে বলে পাচার আছে ইফ ইউ ক্যান সাবস্ট্যানশিয়েট উইথ দ্য হেল্প অফ ডেটা যে প্রচার আছে বলে এই জিনিসগুলো হচ্ছে প্রচার আছে বলে দে হ্যাভ বিকাম মোর অ্যাওয়ার এন্ড দে ফাউন্ড নিউ ওয়েজ টু গো ফর ট্রাফিকিং ইফ ইউ ক্যান সাবস্ট্যানশিয়েট দ্যাট ইট ইজ ওনলি বিকজ অফ অ্যাওয়ারনেস দ্যাট দিস ইজ হ্যাপেনিং উই 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 আর ট্রাইং টু সে দ্যাট সিন্স देयर इज नो अवेयरनेस देयर इज ह्यूमन ट्रैफिक एंड दिस इज कोरिलेटेड लॉट ऑफ स्टडीज आर फाउंड बट Yeah, what you are saying is exactly the reverse. Since there is awareness, there is human traffic. That means it, it has a different connotation altogether. So if you are having sub, if you can substantiate this correlationship, then it doesn't stay as an irrelevant data. Okay, because it, it depends on whether you have substantial uh, backup support uh, to establish this relationship. Since there is awareness, there is more traffic. Okay, if, if it is. initially it was inversely proportional more awareness less trafficking but what he has said is directly proportional more awareness more trafficking okay so you need to have supportive data for that uh steps for conducting a relational analysis the uh, last one was basically a conceptual analysis and then we try to build up the relation uh so it also follows a particular uh, you know uh flow chart Uh, these are the general steps in content analysis uh, put forward your research question uh, conceptualize it uh, sampling and unitizing coding scheme development this coding is becoming very important or one of the uh, major you know research work of of a particular researcher uh, collection of the data uh, actually you can develop your own code book uh um, before starting the actual research so that you can uh get back to your code book to generate the code for the data that you will be collecting okay uh then coding the data you can refer to the coding scheme when you are coding the data then analyzing it and then normally uh finding some conclusion <laughs> with with regard to this you know sampling and unitizing uh In, in quantitative analysis, sampling plays a big role, okay? Uh, because uh, <clears throat> in most of the cases, researchers are accessing uh, infinite population. So, for infinite population, uh, finding out an adequate sample size becomes very difficult. Difficult, okay? So, what we do, we go for confidence in intervals, okay? The estimation. Suppose if anybody wants to do a research on Uh, retail distribution pan india uh, so how many retails are there in india so if anybody asks in this question your research supervisor if he puts forward this question that uh, how do you start how many retails are there in india it's very difficult to answer but there is an answer what is that see there is there is an authority which is called rai retail authority of india but you see retail authority of india every every year they comes out with an annual report but unfortunately in that annual report there is data with regard to organized retail sector only but in india almost 70% or more than 70% of the retail is in an un un organized sector so how do you get an estimation of that so you make an estimation estimation on the basis of population distribution okay say for 5000 population how many retails should be there okay we make a sample study you get a, a proportion and then you scale it up okay say for uh, if you go to the rural area say in a single village say how many rural outlets are there or in a hamlet how many rural outlets are there so is, is it have does it have any connection with the population of the hamlet say 10000 there are uh, say five major retail outlets so you can now scale it up so this is the proportion can, again we are going for estimation isn't it So, in case of quantitative uh, research method, there are a number of sampling plans, like uh, simple random sampling, systematic sampling. These are all probability uh, probability sampling where a definite uh, quantitative norm is followed. But as a researcher, it is uh, I can make make a candid confession that 90% of the researchers are going for non-probability sampling. 
either convenience or judgmental or purposive because of the fact that an academic researcher is working under certain limitations limitation of time limitation of money so it's not possible but very recently what has happened and what will happen in future say for example flipkart wants to make a survey okay or amazon wants to make a survey okay now they want to make a survey to find out what products are uh, the customers are buying frequently in combination with each other because these days you know uh, search engines are not important recommendation engines are more important if you access flipkart once you will find or twice you will find from the third time uh, flipkart will give you certain suggestions people who has purchased this has also purchased this or people who has purchased this has also purchased this plus this plus this so it is recommended to you 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 do not uh, you no further it is required to search they are recommending okay and what will happen in future you see say flipkart wants to make a market survey so the moment we talk about market survey we talk about sampling but why flipkart requires sampling flipkart will only access the customer database that he that it is having so on the flipkart uh, flipkart platform there are crores of customers it can access the entire customer profile why to sample the entire universe is available to them so gradually the more you know e-commerce trend sets in 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 transaction consumer transaction you will find like the banks they do not go for sample why they require sampling because the entire customer database is with them rbi they do not uh, require to go for any kind of sampling so more you have this kind of virtual platform uh, transactions the more this concept of sampling will be obsolete because you have access to universe well, you have access to here yeah, you, you have access to population so generalization will not be a problem okay there there will be no outliers etc etc so it becomes very easy but when it is uh, confound to or constrain to physical transactions there you go for you know something so amra abar arekta jin mone hoy artificial intelligence joto develop korbe tokhon apnar qualitative research e coding korar dorkar korbe hoy to but but i i have a difference of opinion uh, with regard to use of software you see jeta software koreche dhoro spss thik ache Uh, very basic and standard software for analysis quantitative data scholar ra ki korche if your theoretical uh, concept is not clear tumi ekta software use korcho software will give you a number of windows somosto kichu tick korche she thik ache ebar dhoro ekta correlation korche she correlation e pearson er tao tick korche spearman er tao tick একটা প্যারামিটারি এর জন্য একটা নন প্যারামিটারি এর জন্য সে জানেও না সে কি ডেটা নিয়ে অ্যাক্সেস করে व्हाट ডেটা ইজ অ্যাকচুয়ালি অ্যাক্সেসিং এন্ড व्हाट দিস মেশিন উইল ডু দা মেশিন উইল গিভ ইউ আউটপুট ইজন্ট ইট ইফ ইউ টিক দা বক্সেস অ্যাপার্ট ফ্রম সার্টেন কেসেস ইফ দা মেশিন প্রমিস দ্যাট ডেটা ইজ ইনএডিকুয়েট অর ডেটা ইজ ইনসাফিশিয়েন্ট অর ডেটা ইজ নট কম্প্যাটিবল ফর দিস অ্যানালাইসিস অ্যাপার্ট ফ্রম ফিউ কেসেস the number of checks that you are making in several boxes uh, the machine will give you output and these scholars are bringing for a single simple analysis they are bringing 15 to 20 pages output they cannot interpret why they can't interpret because they do not have the theoretical foundation okay they they are, they have gone for regression they have gone for regression a simple regression say for example the crop production depends on rainfall so you can i predict crop uh, production of crop on the basis of rainfall yes i can okay but it, it may not be most of the robust prediction say crop production based on rainfall plus the fertility of the soil it becomes more robust crop production on the base, basis of rainfall fertility of the soil and the quality of the seed it becomes more robust okay so when they are organizing this kind of a, you know experimental designs or you know uh, theoretical model there the concept clarity is very important 
So when you are conducting an MGRI, why people is saying this? Basically, that becomes the grounded part. Uh, the second one is called the semantical content analysis. It classifies codes according to their meanings. What does that code mean? Now again, this semantical content analysis has three uh, types of approaches. Uh, one is called the designation analysis, frequency with which certain objects are mentioned. You know, I will show you one thing in Atlas TI uh, that there can be a process of word cruncher or formation of a word clouds. See, in a particular text or in a particular input, okay, how many times a single word is repeated? So, if a particular is repeated, say, uh, very frequently, that means that particular term is the most critical term in that particular uh, paper. So, in an interview, which term is very frequently repeated? Say, if you are analyzing, uh, say, 20 FGIs in 20 different geolocations, and if you come across a terminology which is most frequently used by all the people of all the geolocations, so probably you can focus on that particular term. Say BPL may be a term if you are analyzing poverty or say uh, say government schemes, one of the government schemes may be a term when you are talking about poverty, uh, physical assets or savings uh, of uh, the rural population, the saving propensity if you are focusing on say bank loans, okay, ease of accessing loans, okay, if that is a term which is frequently spoken. So you can go for uh, this particular uh, designation analysis, frequency with which certain objects are mentioned. Uh, the second approach is attribution analysis, uh, frequency with which certain characterizations and descriptors are used. Characterization and descriptors are words which are basically adjectives. Okay, superior quality, good, bad, worse, excellent, these descriptors whether uh, how many descriptors are being used which descriptor is used very frequently okay and the third one is assertion analysis frequency with which certain objects are characterized in a certain way see assertion analysis is basically a mix of designation and attribution okay assertion analysis it forms a matrix and when we form a matrix you know there are at least two variables so one will be in the row one will be in the column so what is happening in assertion analysis, the descriptors are placed in either in the column or in the row and the, these objects, mentioned objects are placed either in the row or the column. Okay, so if you are placing descriptor in the column, objects will be in the row. So there will be interaction between the descriptors and the objects. So this object, what is the descriptor? Say, say government scheme, the descriptor is good. The government scheme, scheme, the descriptor is excellent. Say government scheme impli implementation, that is the object. Descriptor is poor. So you can easily correlate that they are talking about that the government scheme is good, but the implementation is poor. Okay. <clears throat> and the third one is called the sign vehicle analysis. Classifies content according to the psychophysical properties of the basic, this, this, analyzes the emotion of the interviewees, what we call the sentiment analysis. Okay, they, they are speaking about certain things. There are two things when they are speaking. They are providing you with information and number two, they are expressing their inform, emotion with regard to that particular thing. So, in, in case of sign vehicle analysis, we classify content according to the uh, emotional properties of the codes. Okay. So, these are the three ways with the help of which you can go for FGI analysis, okay. Uh, one is the pragmatical content analysis, the semantical content analysis and sign vehicle analysis. Fundamental ways to go for FGI analysis, okay. And then you can convert, if you want to quantify it, you can bring it to the quantitative software platform, go for Trebendorf's Alpha or Kappa, probably that particular value is also important. Fine, so now let us just uh, have a look into Atlas TI. Um, in the last class we uh, saw this software, uh, the preliminary use of this particular software. So,
what should I do? Should I start a new project and repeat it? New, new. No. So let me just delete this. New one, but I will be using the old data only. Okay. Uh, see, Atlas TI basically is a software with the help of which uh, you can go for analysis of qualitative data. Okay. Uh, analysis of the data means you can go for codification, you can uh, go for uh, issuing memos to the code, you can edit comment, you can associate uh, comment to the codes. And uh, what is your ultimate objective? Ultimate objective is to go for a network. Okay, this is one. Number two, uh, there is a quasi quantitative uh, sort of approach. Quasi quantitative approach means it is neither fully quantitative nor fully qualitative. There is a code co occurrence table. Okay, code co occurrence table basically is the qualitative representative of correlation analysis. Okay, so how many codes are occurring together simultaneously? Or how many codes are associated to a particular document? Okay, like for example, uh, I have said that there are two concepts when you are uh, coding a document. One is called a density of a code and one is called a groundedness of a code. Density of a code means how many codes are intercorrelated with each other. Suppose you have made 15 codes. Out of these 15 codes, how many codes are intercorrelated with each other? Say a specific code A, with how many codes it is correlated? Say it is correlated with X, Y, Z, B, Q, R, say 6. So its density will be 6. Okay. What is the groundedness? Groundedness means how many codes or a specific code with how many quotations or document it is correlated. Okay, say a particular code you are using to codify three different documents because you felt that with the help of that particular code, three different documents can be coded because those documents are almost similar to each other or content is similar. So you are using the same code. So if a particular code is having a grounded property of four, numerical property of four, that means what is the interpretation? That code has been used to code four different types of inputs four different type of data. Okay. One can be a text data, one can be a graphical data, one can be a video data or all the four can be text data, all the four can be uh, video data. Okay. So one code with how many documents that basically is groundedness. Codes, how they are correlated that gives you uh, the idea of the density. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, if you open Atlas TI, uh, basically uh, Atlas TI, um, the eighth version, this, this basically becomes uh, the first, uh, you can say, uh, the interface of Atlas TI. So, uh, you see, there are a few things over here. One is, uh, two things basically. One is called create a new project or if you are already having a previous project, you can just go for importing that project. Okay. Uh, if you have stored certain things in your Google Drive, you can access directly from if you have stored something in your google drive say a project is stored over there you can directly access it from there okay so i shall be creating a new project so let me go for the same name the sustainable development so you give a project name and then you click create so you see a new project is created. This is this is the page of the new project. Okay, uh, at the top you will find the name that you have just given. It will appear. I have given the name Sustainable Development in short that is SD. Okay, so it will appear. So this is basically uh, the initial page of Atlas TI. Okay, and you you will find that there are three panels. One this horizontal panel. Second one is this vertical panel and third one is this space, okay. So over here you will have all the operations, okay. You can code it, you can put your memo, 
Uh, you can select quotations, you can import document, you can add documents from here, you can also go for quotations and coding from here. Okay, you can edit comment from here. So th this is basically is your operational tool. And you see, uh, there are several uh, areas. Like, see, for example, if I click, say, analyze, uh, you will find uh, that there is a query tool. Basically, it's a retrieval uh, process of the data from the software. Uh, this is the code co-occurrence table that I was uh, referring to. This gives you a nice interpretation of how the codes are interlinked with each other. And you can see, I will show you that there is a probability uh, that you will get a coefficient over here also. It is called a C coefficient. Like in case of uh, numerical data, there is a coefficient analysis called Pearson's R or Spearman's Rho uh, in correlation, bivariate correlation analysis. Here, there is a concept of C, C correlation. And uh, in the last class, I also told that if you are enabling this intercoder mode, that means you are actually allowing others to code to the same document. And intercoder mode becomes very important when you are accessing Atlas TI cloud. So if you are uh, working in cloud platform, uh, whereby there are multiple researchers in multiple destinations, they can work on the uh, same document in real time manner. Okay. Sir, I have a question. Sir, I have a question. I have a question. That is the thing. If I have a question, I have a question. If I have a question, I have a question. If I have a question, I have a question. I have a question. Actually, uh, collaborative research work is a Pradhan it makes a multi-dimensional uh, input. On a uh, feature of the software is overwrite. code is the same quotation type code It is basically exchange of or sharing of opinions. Okay. अपन जब हम पूरों इनपुट टा कोडिफाई हुए जावे, then there will be an intercoder agreement। जे कौन कोड गुलो हमने डाल पो, कौन कोड गुलो के हमने छेड़ पे लो। Because अब ये लोगों में तो बारे एक सिंगल कोटेशन के तुम अपनी मल्टीपल कोड जे दारा कोड को दबा रहे। Because you you feel after discussion with each other, the, this particular quotation has implication in this 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 area. So all the codes may be retained or some codes may be suppressed, some codes may be selected. Okay, so it is not the case that you have to select one code code code, one code 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 uh, you can bring your Zotero or Mendeley or EndNote over here. Uh, you can bring your survey data. You can export your, import your code book that I was referring in uh, content analysis. You can prepare the code book first. Uh, anything you can export as SPSS job. Up to the further analysis term, you can bring it to. Like in case of sentiment analysis, normally what we do, we export the entire data into Excel. Okay, in a, what I do basically is Excel at Adina, which is called an analytic solver. Basically, it's a data mining feature. Okay, so Jokon Ami Twitter, take a Jokonami data knee on Twitter the text data, extensive text data. So, there has to be a process with the help of which text can be mined. Text mining is uh, possible. So, in MS Excel, there is a possibility with the help of which text mining can be done. Text mining is called classifications of data, clustering of the data. I mean, I sentiment that you have to read it. You have to read it. You have to read it. A particular tweet. Say, uh, removal of Article 370, which is very uh, recent, only yesterday. So, somebody has made a tweet. Say, Shashi Tharud has made a tweet, and there are 2,000 retweets. So, I am very much interested about those retweets. Because retweets carry the opinion profile of, say, 2,000 people. So when I am bringing that retweet, there will be a number of words, number of phrases, sentences. I need to aggregate those. And I need to find out 
what proportion is supporting the move say positive uh, tweets what proportion is opposing the move say negative tweets what proportion is very diplomatic neither uh, positive nor negative very very neutral type of tweets so uh, after that i can make a analysis of the general sentiment of uh, the people okay so you can import these data uh, uh, the ne next one is the tools and support. You can go here in the. Uh, the machine will divide the sentimental issues. In the yeah, yeah. Even if you go to say, uh, see, our kade tweet actually analyze kuri. Our tweet ke uri tweet korbe na. We tweets basically is uh, for those people who are having a tremendous fan following or public uh, presence. Diga okay. je. आज जो भी मोदी वाले जी एक टाइम जो ट्वीट करे तार रिट्वीट होते वाले आज डोनाल्ड ट्रंप एक टाइम ट्वीट करे तार रिट्वीट होते वाले सो वी आर गोइंग फॉर दोस थिंग्स ना के जे आमी एक जोने ट्वीट टके निये तार जे सेंटीमेंट एसोसिएटेड विद द रिट्वीट समी शटेस्ट्स यस मशीन कैन एक्चुअली क्लासि� uh, say it should have been discussed more uh, elaborately in the parliament before taking such a decision. Now, how will you interpret this tweet as a negative tweet or a positive tweet or as a neutral tweet? Okay, so what the machine will do, they will try to uh, understand the words. Which word say it is a good move, say good will be associated with positive. Okay. Say again, if somebody has said it will, it will increase terrorism in Kashmir or it will increase the probability of insurgency in Kashmir. Okay, so they will immediately try to find out. Okay, insurgency is a term which is very negative. Okay, so it will classify like that. So it is all, all, all on the basis of the type of descriptors that you are using the adjectives or any other type of words that you are using, they will classify, make their own codes and then say it. So, therefore, therefore, I'm not going to do I do not normally use this at last year. I, I use a different software. <coughs> I will, I will, if time permits, I will. Sir, so, the government can quantify the words negative. No, no, quantify, 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 no, out of 2000. Okay. Although I had a Twitter month, so basically 70% is positive. So if 70% is positive, then we can say that people's sentiment is like, see, these uh, consultants like Prashant Kishore and all that, what they do actually, they mine the public sentiment and then they provide the consultation to the CM or PM. Isn't it? They do nothing. They use this kind of tools. They make a sample survey, they try to find out the public sentiment with regard to something, with regard to governance, with regard to everything, a public distribution system, public governance, etc. And then they try to find out what is the lacuna of this government and uh, give consultancy to the government, you do this. So it is, if it is Jono Sanjo, you do that, if it is Didi Ke Bolo, you do that. So from where it is coming? It is coming from the mining of the public sentiment. So they, they refer, but again, uh, emotions or sentiment analysis, like one of, one of my teachers, uh, Shumon, Professor Shumon Basurai, uh, he is working uh, at University of Denver, okay, State University of Denver in USA. He was in our university in the last year. He is doing a nice job. Actually, he is running a project uh, with the Universal Studio, okay. He, he did a, a preliminary project with 20th century fox. His area is the Hollywood movie release movie and now Sorry. the producer, that movie is a big uh, box office hit. That means the revenue collection is huge. Okay. Now the producer is in a dilemma whether to go for a sequel or not because it was found earlier that the borrow, uh, box office revenue hole, the sequel to the borrow of the number of failures are there. Okay. So, uh, Professor Basura is working on a predictive model with the help of which he, he can identify that eta to the sequel launch kuri, tale sheta koto ta initial revenue generate match up kora dhwara. Mane, first step thheke koto ta bigger hobe, first step 
so they match kar do par bhi so what he is basically doing he is actually analyzing the sentiment and emotions and expectations of the audience related to the first film okay so if it is harry potter say the last sequel just before that the seventh part he he did that survey and he said that it doesn't require any prediction because this is not a sequel because you are actually uh, dragging a story from the first part and you are ending in the end so if it is a sequence of a story it doesn't require any prediction okay like in case of godfather part 1 part 2 part 3 it was the same story divided into three parts so it is not a sequel actually it's the same story i am clubbing uh, uh, dividing into splitting in three halves but if it is 1 2 3 with same characters different story different set uh, backdrops etc then it requires prediction so he is working on that and he has developed a number of uh, predictive models but again since you are dealing with sentiments and emotions it's very subjective it is very time bound because emotions don't stay with you for long it may change okay so those are the things uh so over here you can go to uh you can go for uh, these are links uh, you can go for manual uh, quick tour of atlas here when you will be using probably you will buy certain manual uh, so you can go it uh, go to this directly from here okay fine so let us start see uh, this is this is the home page so what is the first thing i want to do i want to add documents because Uh, what is the doc? See, the, the first recommendation is all the data, all the input data. You make sure that they are nicely categorized and stored in a folder in your computer hard drive, so that it is it becomes easily accessible uh, to you. You can have one or two things in a in a folder. You keep it. Okay. So all the video files. So in, in the last class, I showed you the descriptor, how it should be uh, stored. Uh, with specific names, say FGI in this geo location, uh, you can put a number of FGI also uh, with a date. Okay, uh, why geo location is important? Because particularly for the social science people who are working across multiple geographical locations, it becomes very important for them uh, to find out whether I can integrate all the geographical results into a single result. যে বীরভূমের লোকেরা কি সেই একই কথা বলছে যেটা মাকুরার লোক বলছে বা মুর্শিদাবাদের লোক বলছে বা মালদার লোক বলছে ইট বিকামস ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট ফর দ্য রিসার্চ টু ইন্টিগ্রেট ডেটা অ্যাক্রস মাল্টিপল জিও লোকেশন সো ওয়েন ইউ আর স্টোরিং ফাইল পুট দ্য জিও লোকেশন ওকে সো ক্লিক দিস ওয়ান দিস ইজ বেসিক্যালি অ্যাড ডকুমেন্ট অ্যান্ড ইউ অ্যাড ফাইলস ওকে say uh, in this uh, particular file i have pdf files i have doc files i have video files i have image files so i will incorporate everything okay say i am taking this i am taking this 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 say these are the text files after selecting you click open so now what the software will do uh, the software will add the documents and before adding the documents it will convert the documents which will be compatible with the atlas ti software so it takes its own time exactly you know uh, identify what sort of emotions you are having 
uh, what I am uh, repeatedly saying is they identify emotion on the basis of the words that he was using as a descriptor. Say, I am going to say what type of words I am choosing. Selection of those words have a special kind of meaning for this processor. Okay. Even Shopsma is a set of words that you can fit in the name. So, the machine emotion that becomes <coughs> very mechanical in nature. I am still scared. Hmm. But again, when you are analyzing big data, you do not have any other way but to rely on machine. <coughs> okay. Because big data basically is unstructured. Facebook data, Twitter data, WhatsApp data, Instagram, <coughs> Pinterest, Dropbox, all these data are very unstructured and a lot of you know special characters, hashtags and all that. So interpretation becomes very difficult. So I have added five documents over here and if you click this particular triangle you will find all the five documents have come here. Okay, so if I click this, then this document will open in this window pane. See, these window panes are very flexible. You, we, according to your, you know, uh, use, you can uh, increase or decrease. See, suppose th this is basically uh, one of the documents which can be considered as a literature review input. It is not a survey data. I do not have a survey data, so I could not show you. Now, if I want to find out uh, what are the most prominent words that are used in this particular thing. See, there is, there is an option called word cloud over here. Have you seen it? Okay, you just click it. So, it will create a word cloud for you. Uh, see, uh, in this particular word cloud, probably change, development and climate. These, these three words are very important. Uh, if I go back to my home, um, say, if I create a word list, Now you see, uh, I can actually exclude a number of things to make it more interpretable. Say a single character word I want to exclude, okay? Numbers I want to exclude, hyphens I want to exclude, underscores I want to exclude, okay? Now if I, if I start studying from here, say from this one, say from a bit, okay? So all these terminologies, uh, how many times it has been repeated, you will find uh, that certain, certain uh, terminologies say, uh, say accountability has been repeated 14 times. Now, by seeing this, you cannot interpret anything. Whether accountability has been repeated in connection with sustainability, that gives you an interpretation. Okay, so accountability it is not any anything any any it doesn't give you any significant uh, you know conclusion. But whether accountability has been used in conjunction with sustainability and how many times that's why you know the code co-occur and stable becomes very important. How many times they are co-occur? Okay. Uh, say for example activity and policy. 15 times, but whether that activity and policy is used with the sustainability schemes or the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals that are set by the government or by the United Nations. Okay, so whether they are being used in conjunction with that. So uh, th this is one of the way, like adaptation, mitigation. This is this is a legal terminology. Okay, mitigation. Okay, so how sustainable issues are being mitigated? So what are the legal connotations? So you need to identify how they are connected with the legal issues of sustainability. Okay. 
Okay, not, you, you, it's you, not here. It's not here. Means in this laptop. It's it's not here. Here. No, no, you need, need not add. You see, have you added any document? Okay, you just open, have you opened the document? You click the document, it will open, it will come over in this area. Where is the word list? I mean, only word list that I have printed out, what shop does? Anyway, <coughs> see, I have exported, I have, sorry, so you imported. What is the three terms that have What is the three terms? What is the three terms? What is the three terms? Filter, filter, eight version, take it. I will, it's not really taken. I will see after the class I will see. Anyway, <coughs> see, I have, I have imported five documents, but these are text files. So, what we did in the last class also, let us, uh, add files uh, which are videographies say two video files I am having and uh, uh, certain pictures okay. suppose normally when you are uh, accessing pictures from the internet a number of us are taking pictures on the internet also. We, which are actually, uh, we can say, <coughs> uh, very compatible with our study, isn't it? We we use a number of pictures. So how how do you uh, take pictures? How do you access pictures? In fact, say for example. Say, say I want to um, find out certain pictures which which are related to sustainable development. Since 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 I am making a hypothetical present presentation, I have not gone to the field to collect certain pictures. Otherwise, the best thing is go to Popeyes, take certain snapshots, go to certain uh, forest area where sustainable works are being carried out, take certain snapshots. So what normally we do, we go for Google and uh, we uh, type it, na. Sustainability, say, pics. So once you click these pictures, or sustainable, say, make it more precise. Fine. How do you? So you you are taking pictures from this area. How do you know it is not? Uh, whether it is copyrighted or not. You, you are stealing basically, na? Hey, if it is copyrighted. But we get the source, na? Even if you are taking yeah, naming the yeah. source, mm, over here, if you are if you are taking copying a particular picture, it, it doesn't give you full right to use that particular picture. Full right. To to uh, use it uh, non-commercially, to modify it, etc. etc. So on the safer side. Uh, to be on the safer side, you should access, uh, have access to those content which, which gives you the right to reuse. Okay. So the next time you search, if this kind of a window opens, so if you are putting something in the Google search, and this picture, <coughs> uh, consortium of picture comes up, you straight away go to this tool. Okay. There, there, there is a tool. You click it. You go to usage rights, okay, and click labeled for non-commercial use with modification. So you have two rights now. One is you are using it, <coughs> reusing it, but for non-commercial purpose because since it will be associated with academic projects only, it will be non-commercial only. And the second right is you can modify it. Okay, so. <coughs> But the unfortunate thing is, once you click this, the good picture vanishes. Okay, the number of options <laughs> becomes very few. Okay, so you can use this. So uh, now you don't suffer from any, you know, plagiarism, or uh, you do not suffer from any, you know, unethical practices. So you, you can use like this. Anyway. Uh, you see, uh, this 
a particular uh, document now is having 11 documents <coughs> and out of these 11 documents uh, there are five text documents and uh, four graphical documents like this type of picture is there okay and uh, then there are certain video documents also so we can directly play these uh, video documents right here <coughs> Okay, so th th these are the documents uh, that you have uh, given as an input for your analysis. Okay, so let us start the analysis process quickly. Text file. Text file I have shown you. This say uh, this is this is one of the text files. So let us, the first thing that we need to do is to open the document and code it. Okay, go through the documents and uh, uh, as a researcher you are basically coding all those important parts. Okay, the important sections of the document. Say I am randomly opening a particular document. Uh, this uh, document is about environmental, social and economic sustainability implications for actuarial studies. Fine. So let us just read the document briefly and try to find out what does this document uh, tell us. Say over here there is an issue uh, pointed out as uh, social sustainability. Okay, so if 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 you want to. Uh, code something, what you need to do is to place your cursor over here, you just click it and then you draw it. Okay, the normal process with the help of which you are selecting a document uh, in your you know, uh, Word document when you are selecting a portion of your Word document. So, once you select this particular uh, portion, uh, this particular portion becomes your quotation. Okay, so the concept of quotation is, the concept of quotation is the actual part of the raw data, okay, that you are selecting for coding. So now you have a few options, you can go for right click and go for open coding, this is one option. The second option is, the open coding is here, you can go from, you know, creating an open coding here, or if you go to home, there is new entities, you go for new codes, you can create code. So you have a number of options with the help of which you can create a code. So let us right click and go for open coding. Say this speaks about social sustainability. Okay. Uh, sustainable development. Social perspective. Okay, so I am just creating the code. Now you see what has happened is on this right hand side a code appears. This is the length of the quotation. You see uh, this, this particular thing is basically this quotation. Okay, and we have added a code. So this particular quotation has been coded with the help of this quotation. Okay. Now, in our last class we said that we can actually make a comment about our code. So if you click this code and then right click it, you select this code first by left clicking and then right click it and add an edit comment. So a you know comment box will come and you can say something about this code. Okay, say this code is about social issues pertaining to uh, sustainable development okay and you save this code additionally what you can do additionally i can associate a memo okay now what is a memo and how memo is different from that of a code 
a code is a part of the original document uh, a code is basically uh, a summary or a representative tag of the original uh, document a part of the original document okay so in a when when i am assigning a code i am selecting a part of the original document and then placing a particular uh, sentence or a word etc etc that explains this part okay now what is a memo memo explains the code okay memo is something that is researcher's own memo is something that a researcher wants to explore further so suppose you you have uh, brought you, you you have coded a part of say